but hello, it's wonderful to, uh, to be here with you today and actually dig a little deeper in the diversity issue. Uh, it's something that we've touched on, I think, in almost all of the different segments today. But now we're going to have an opportunity to really, really look a little deeper as we move forward on this. Uh, my name is Trish Costello. Uh, I am the CEO and founder of Portfolio. And Portfolio is an equity crowdfunding platform or an aggregating, angel aggregating platform that focuses on unlocking women as angels across the US. So there's uh, 5 million women that are accredited with only about 20,000 that have ever uh, invested in an entrepreneurial company. And so if we change that, I, I believe we're going to change and shift a lot of things uh, for the, in the whole entrepreneurial equation. We have an amazing panel with us this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to just introduce them and uh, mention the organization they're with. Uh, then I'll make a few more comments about uh, the environment, frame it a little bit, and then we'll jump right in. And we're looking to have about at least five minutes at the end for questions. So to my left is Alicia Robb from the Kauffman Foundation, one of the leading researchers in the entrepreneurship and investing world. So it's great to have you, Alicia. Brian Dixon. Brian is a venture capitalist with Kapoor Capital. And as many of you may know, Kapoor Capital is really one of the, the leading, probably the leading venture firm that is uh, <coughs> committed to diversity and to really looking a lot deeper um, and invest in many minority entrepreneurs and women. Christine Kim is with us as the, uh, she's the chief economist at the SBA. Uh, and another uh, noted researcher. So we have both Dr. Rob and Dr. Kim with us today. Uh, it's great to have you. And then we have Rodney Sampson with us. And Rodney, you're a new friend of mine, so just getting to know more about what you're doing. Uh, you lead Opportunity Hub and are uh, a very active angel and are looking at investing uh, as well from an economic development standpoint, as I understand. So we'll get into a little bit more of that. Well, this is one of the really enduring challenges for women and minorities and others that have traditionally been left out of kind of the whole institutional investing um, area, really been left out of the uh, ability to access the kind of capital that we all need to run, to start and run and grow our businesses and create wealth. Because that's, of course, the, the greatest opportunity to create wealth is through uh, the kind of startups that we're looking at today. Um, Alicia and Christine are going to be able to give us the, some great updated statistics. But you know what we know, because we anytime we open the paper anymore or even turn on uh, a business program, I think it's really starting to be front and center how pernicious this is when you're unable uh, to access the kind of money, mostly, I believe, from an unconscious bias but that it's certainly out there in the venture world where uh, probably less than 1% of minorities, uh, African American or Hispanics, are able to access, you know, give venture capital. And it's about uh, over 90% of the money is going to young white males invested in by old white males. And so, some young white males. <laughs> and some young white males. Uh, I had the opportunity to create the Kaufman Fellows Program 20 years ago. Uh, and part of our goal was to really open up that meritocracy in the venture capital world. And, and some of that's happened, but it's probably still the area where we have, have less uh, diversity than anywhere else, and it's impacting all of us. So our question today is, crowdfunding is really the, the new opportunity for investing that's popped up since women and minorities have had the kind of power and education and knowledge to be able to be successful in this space. Is this going to shift it? Is it going to open up for women, minorities, LGBT, rural areas, uh, and others, and actually start to level the playing field as well? So that's really the question that, that we, we toss out here. So I'm going to ask each of you to talk a little bit about what you're doing now um, in the area of diversity and opening up opportunity. And, um, you know, Tell us that first picture. Is this going to happen? Is this going to change it um, for women and minorities and others that have been left out of the system? 
Um, thanks. Uh, I think it will. And I, some of the research that I've been doing uh, recently has used Kickstarter data, but I'm moving on to look at equity financing um, from on crowdfunding platforms. But some of the research that we've seen using the Kickstarter data shows that um, actually women are, have a higher representation uh, um, as investors or um, on, the, on the purchaser side than actually on the uh, entrepreneur or project leader side. So over 40% of the um, people giving money on Kickstarter are actually women. And it's, that compares with about 30 or 32% of the project leaders on this platform. Why this is important is that we see this tendency of homophily in investing and just in life. You like to hang out with people like you. Well, when 90% of the investors are white males, they like to invest in what they know, and that's honestly often things that white males do. So having more women on the funding side is going to be very important to getting more funding <coughs> to women entrepreneurs. So I think the Kickstarter research is, um, shows some pretty promising uh, signs that this is going to actually uh, level the playing field on the um, debt financing and the equity financing. After Personally, after being an investor on Kickstarter and Indiegogo, I, I'm very active investing in projects. I then went on to invest in Prosper and Lending Club and AngelList and so forth, and it actually got to angel investing. So, I mean, I'm one case in point that this is teaching women how to become active investors in their communities and businesses. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, um, so I guess I'll start off from the kid for capital perspective. Um, we're a big believer of the crowd, uh, crowdfunding in general. Um, we're investors in AngelList, um, and um, we've kind of seen that we can only do so much with a small firm um, as far as placing investment. So that number you threw out in the beginning, uh, <coughs> less than 1%. Um, with our portfolio, it's 46% either a woman uh, founder on the team or a person of color. And the reason why it's so high is because we actually go out and try to find deals at places like Women 2.0 or Black Founders or many uh, diverse conferences. So um, I think that the deals are out there. Um, it's up to the investors and angels um, to go out and find them. Um, as far as crowdfunding goes, though, thinking about just, just AngelList, um, it changed the way how VCs do business. Um, we, we have to go to AngelList daily um, and other sites as well to kind of find deals. Um, especially for hardware startups, um, you know, we're going to Kickstarter and we're going out to look for uh, companies on Kickstarter and Indiegogo um, for the trending campaigns because these are companies that not only um, have the initial traction, um, they've, they've shown they can get a product, if they can get interest in a product, they might not have shipped the product yet, but um, it's a really good indicator that you didn't have before crowdfunding um, because you just have a presentation deck and this is what we're going to do we go to market, now you have, you know, they've got 2,000 backers um, actually signed up to buy this thing. So um, it's a game changer. Um, it's going to be a real thing. It already is a real thing. Um, and it will continue to be as Title III kind of opens, opens mm -hmm. things up. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of potential uh, right now in crowdfunding. And I think that discussions like these are so important because we're really in the formative stages. And it's about, you know, being mindful about precedent that you're going to set in terms of um, being aware of um, how you can use the system to encourage diversity uh, among business owners. And we know from research, for instance, that Alicia's done that there's both demand and supply side impacts in traditional lending forums. Because in addition to access to capital issues in terms of you know just your strict denial issues, that there are discouraged borrowers out there. And I think crowdfunding offers um, sort of that reciprocal uh, opportunity because it offers not just an alternative lending uh, platform in terms of supply, but for prospective uh, borrowers, it offers them an avenue where they, they may not feel as discouraged and where they may feel like they have an opportunity to uh, go to a market where they may be perhaps better received than they traditionally have. I think there's hope. Um, I'd like to give a little context, though. Why does this disparity exist? So uh, 2010 U.S. Census Bureau numbers um, around the racial wealth gap in America. So the average net worth of a Caucasian 
uh, family in America is $110,000. Average net worth of an Asian American family is $76,000. I was over there and come all over here. Latino American family, 7,600. African American family, less than $5,000. So that gives us some context. At the same time, and I'm going to talk more from an African American perspective, um, gross spending power annually of 40 million African Americans uh, exceeds $1 trillion. So, I think it's just, the, the capital is there. It's just a function of exposure, uh, a function of education, and a function of access. Um, on the ground in Atlanta, we own Opportunity Hub. It's a network of co-working spaces. Uh, what we learned early on was that we couldn't just be a co-working space. Uh, we had to provide programming, education, knowledge, a real definitive breakdown of what the investment ecosystem looks like. At first, I thought, you know, it was kind of like the Spike Lee thing, this was just a black thing. And then I started going to my alma mater, Tulane, and Penn State, and traveled around, and, you know, average white kid sitting in the room doesn't know about, you know, valuation and equity either. They have to learn. They just have the exposure there. So I think that knowledge gap can be dispelled uh, just by us continuing uh, to expose the culture, you know, to this innovation and funding. The last three years, a lot of folks in the room, Jason and Richard, um, have come to the conferences we've held in Atlanta and D.C. We probably have exposed over 5,000 people to the Jobs Act, to interstate crowdfunding, um, et cetera. We're on a personal mission also to take a lot of successful African Americans that have benefited from, I would say, the uh, affirmative action policies of government contracting. Actually, black males and white women have benefited the most. Uh, Mayor Jackson, one of the mayors in Atlanta, uh, pioneered government contracting, supplier diversity in government contracting. So there are a lot of successful business people um, that have just never been exposed to angel investment. And we're starting to do that now. Um, Brian, yes, is probably one of the anomalies in the venture capital ecosystem. But slowly and surely, I think that's starting to change. You have the Paul Judges of the world. You have the Troy Carters of the world. You have the Val, Mos Val Moses of the world. We kind of identified an informal network of black angels, probably about 100 of us in the country. Now, comparatively speaking, uh, but we have to start somewhere. So I think that this innovation in the capital markets legislation allows for many more people to on-ramp into the investment ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's what we're seeing too, Rodney, with women, is that, you know, if you look at this with, uh, <coughs> um, you know, all the, the companies, you know, 45% now, I believe, Villa companies are now owned by women. Am I close now? Yeah. Still. Still at 30. 30. You should have been at Navo this week. You would have heard a lot different numbers. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but it's been a private club for so long. And so it's not like, you know, there's so many women. Uh, we uh, Women own, you know, I think it's uh, the last I've seen is the $11.2 trillion. And the fact that that money is not unlocked at all uh, around entrepreneurial companies is just a, it's just a real problem for us, you know, even as, a, as an economy, as an entrepreneurial economy. But so much of it is, is that we just weren't invited into those clubs. And because it's private, you know, they're private solicitations, they are, they are clubs, you need to be invited in. You know, you need to know about those. And so uh, I think that training piece is going to be really important. And I think the laws of, I can just jump in, the laws are disruptive enough that you've got a certain consciousness of the community that's saying, if you don't invite me in, that's okay. I'm just gonna do it myself. And then once we prove out the economic model, then if you want in, et cetera. And I think that switches the paradigm from the uh, perception that there is a you know, handout model that we're looking for. No, these are viable startups with viable co-founders with viable models. Mm -hmm. Kay Popper, which is a great friend of mine, we have these conversations all the time that the conversation about meritocracy in capital markets is a farce when you start looking at the true equity and parity. Mm -hmm. So we want to invite you know, those who are experienced in the capital markets 
you know, come mentor. Let's match our money. Get in on our deal flow. Yes. And uh, let's do some great things. So, Brian, you mentioned AngelList earlier. And, and one thing, you know, uh, <coughs> You know, we're looking here because, we, of course, we do have a, a couple of early equity platforms that are out there, like Angelus, Funders Club, and, you know, a number of others that were even listed earlier. But with Angelist, I think it's less than 9% of the angels on there are women. And, um, and they're not even certain of that because they don't, they don't track it. And I would, I would estimate or guess that probably the numbers of minorities are way low as well. So the few models that we have out there now Aren't, they might make it better, cheaper, faster for the traditional Silicon Valley approach, but are they really, you know, what's going to cause it to be different for a wider audience? Yeah, I mean, it, and you're right. Um, if you look on AngelList, it's the same folks who are currently investing. Um, and there are some new, some new folks on there, but it, the floodgates aren't open yet. Yeah. And I think um, once Title III comes on board, a lot of these equity uh, platforms are going to make that change, right? Um, there's going to be, I think in the beginning, it's going to be the Wild West. Um, they're probably going to have um, some people lose out on money, right? And it's going to be tough. I, I don't think it's going to be a smooth transition. You, you're taking folks who haven't invested for so long and now they have this new opportunity. Um, they haven't done diligence on a deal. You're not interacting directly with a, a founder. Um, you're going through a third party of whatever is information that's kind of out there. That's all you have. Um, there's going to be a lot of challenges. So by no means uh, do I think it's going to be necessarily smooth. I think they're trying their best to make it that way. Um, but I think Title III does change a lot um, for, for a lot of folks. And right now, that bar, that income bar of the 200K for three years of the million dollars of liquid assets is a problem for, especially when you talk about African American, Hispanic, etc. cetera. Um, so until that barrier is removed, um, I think it'll continue to be the same players um, on there. Um, and once Title III comes out, we should see some, some, some mm -hmm. shift. I feel like I'm going to have to be Toby Stewart here and say, Jumping. you know, I just don't know how, how big of a deal Title III is actually going to be. Because when you think about equity financing and you think of the types of investments that equity investors make, they want a, 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 not only a stake in the company, but they want a board seat. They want to be involved. They want to be mentors. They want to be advisors. They want to be you know, on the board. And I think what we're going to see is the type of WeFunder platform where they are aggregating a bunch of very small investments into a single investment vehicle and doing an equity investment that way. But even the, the kind of people who would want to opt into something like that versus just investing their money into Prosper or into Lending Club and getting an adequate return that's a hell of a lot better than the bank. Yeah. You know, if I can get five or 10% return on my investments, why am I going to go throw my money away basically in equity investment because I'm probably not going to see that back. Yeah. So I really don't see Title III having such a huge phenomenal shift that the, the press makes it out to be. If you look at how many accredited investors who are, have the ability to invest, it's a very small portion of people that actually go out and do it. So if we just all of a sudden I don't know, I think there'd be more of a shift if we just go actually out and, and educate those people and say, hey, you know, see what you're missing out on, see how you could be involved in your community and get involved in the entrepreneurial ecosystem by investing in businesses in your community. I would see that as more of a seminal shift than, you know, bringing people with, you know, net worth of 50K or something yeah. or, uh, into, I, I into this. I mean, yeah. how many accredited investors you know are going to Ferguson, you know, or going to some parts of Chicago? They're not, but you got startup, you know, coders. You know, you look at Code Academy. You look at some of the different um, uh, innovation that's coming out of the hood, quote unquote. Those accredited investors aren't going there. So if I, you know, need to raise 50k just to get my app off the ground, I think there's a huge opportunity to educate hyper local communities where whether we partner with a church or a synagogue or a mosque or what have you and we crowd $50,000. And what we're doing in our culture, we're actually in the middle of an interstate race in Georgia. And we see this enlightenment occurring amongst working poor, working professionals, and accredited investors who've never seen an operating agreement, they have never seen an offering circular, but they're making an investment for the very first time. HBCU students from um, Spelman, Clark, and Morehouse 
that have never had the opportunity, they now see themselves as a mini shark. What we call it the minnow tank. They see Damon John, they see Mark Cuban, and they're saying, I'm investing not because I understand valuation and what the possible return is. I'm investing because if I don't invest, I will never disrupt poverty and the wealthy out of my community. And even if these companies fail, which most of them will, I will create jobs in the meantime. And if I create jobs in the meantime, I'm going to decrease the frustration in an unemployed male or female from any racial demographic that's going to be mugging somebody because they need ramen noodles or they need food. Mm -hmm. So I think it's how we educate the culture in terms of why you should get engaged with crowdfunding. Because like Brian said, they're going to probably, it's going to be a wild, wild west. So a lot of education is going to be required. I mean, we sync up constantly with the diversity inclusion arm. Uh, at the SBA, at the SEC, on how do we prepare the markets once Title III goes live, and how do we have these hyper-local, how do we cut down on fraud, and how do we engage community Because if not, you'll have legislation, and you'll still have unfundable or un, you know, companies that don't get capital. So I think there's a balance between the two policies. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now it's going to seem like we're freeloading on the applause here. <laughs> 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 um, you know, I, I have similar uh, perspective on that, which is that, you know, I think, and I just did a roundtable uh, a couple days ago on diversity and STEM entrepreneurship, and there are women in my research. And their perspective, I thought, was really um, insightful, which was that, you know, for us, crowdfunding, it's a great alternative lending resource, but for us, it's really a springboard into larger VC, other opportunities, um, but really it's sort of like a way to get that social capital that they don't have. They're not in the clubs right now, but you know, uh, in, in economics, in political economics, there's something called expressive voting, and it's sort of um, the idea of why would I vote if I know that I'm not the person who's gonna decide who the president is, right? But I might vote because I know that people before me fought for the right to vote, and I want to make a statement in that regard. So there, there's an element, I think, that even at the reward level, you can make a statement. You can uh, stand for your community, and then that creates a bridge that gives you the exposure, the equivalent of the social capital that then ultimately can build into the signal that this is a company that stands <coughs> on its own, that has its own value, and then, then the conventional institutions or the VCs or the angels who are coming in with a lot more. Um, you know, even today, that is a pre-Title III uh, a potential that we see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Rodney, I mean, you're in the only state, right? I mean, I think there are 14 or 15 states where you have interest state. But on the panel, you're, you're, you have the experience with that. What are you seeing now with the interest state crowdfunding in, uh, in Atlanta? It's been I mean, six or eight months or longer? You know, so our advisor, um, Vincent, Attorney Vincent Russo, wrote the legislation. He was the securities commissioner, the equivalent of the securities commissioner for Secretary of State for Georgia when he wrote it. He's now in private practice. Uh, we keep him on our team so we stay out of trouble. Um, Let's just a, just a second. Here. Do you, you all know? Uh, I don't know how many. Uh, there are a number of people from outside of the country, but but because the the well the federal inter uh, the federal crowdfunding for under the two hundred thousand income is not yet in effect. The regulations haven't been approved, but there are a number of states, with Atlanta being or Georgia being one of the first that's actually in, uh, implemented that within your state. So that's really what we're talking about, that, that sure. you actually have the low. And, and the law parallels to the Jobs Act, to some degree, Title III. So you can raise up to a million dollars every 12 months from non-accredited investors. Uh, when we prepared our offering circular, we wanted to establish a precedent that modeled the proposed rules of Title III. So the same proposed limitations of income and what you can invest, and et cetera, we wanted to apply that in anticipation of the rules. The other thing we wanted to do was establish, establish best practices for other companies to do the same. So like we created a website, 1000founders.com, 1000founders.com. And I must give this disclaimer, this is not an offer, and it's only for Georgia residents. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, and I know there's a lot of you know a lot of concern or what have you around the federal and the state. And I'm sure that'll all shake out. Um, there is not a lot of buzz about it, except the buzz that we're creating. Two deals. There are two. One deal has been funded um, to date. Bohemian Guitars on the SparkMarket.com platform. What's interesting are their consumer product. They raised a hundred and I mean thirty, forty thousand dollars. Uh, they have now pivoted as the first non-tech company to be accepted into 500 startups. So someone said earlier, with the 10,000 crowdfunders and you know, you know, billion dollar valuation, I think there is something to prove the model out with the crowd, and that you know, being your customer discovery, from ideation to customer discovery, et cetera. Um, we are in the early stages of our, of our act, active campaign, it is going very slow because I'm personally taking time to talk to every investor. The light bulb is going on. And again, I'm talking to people who've never invested, whether they are a physician, whether they own a $50 million company, or whether they are on welfare, just to keep it real. We have investors from the spectrum, and we're taking the time to walk them through what a deal looks like. <coughs> And the light bulb comes on in terms of, wow, I just feel like I'm a part of something. I'm here. I don't expect to become a millionaire. I don't expect to make a ton of money. I probably will lose my money. But just to know that I'm helping you help other entrepreneurs live their dreams. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're truly ecstatic you know, about that. How it will end, we have a pretty aggressive raise. It's, it's $600,000. We can't break escrow until we raise the first 50K. We've got commitments for about 40. What we're seeing, though, is we've had two um, pretty prominent angel investors approach us saying, keep me abreast of the raise because I might want to come in for 200,000 or 300,000. So the raise itself becomes a part of your marketing engine, mm -hmm. um, in a sense. And even if we don't raise all the money, which we don't really expect to, what we expect to do is use it as a way to create momentum and to educate just the everyday American citizen on how they can participate inside of the startup ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things uh, that I think is, is interesting as well is not just what's happening here, but what's happening overall with the change in the kind of companies that are being funded by even traditional VCs. And, you know, 10 years ago, the uh, uh, nine out of 10 companies were enterprise companies uh, uh, of some sort or, or um, you know, major expensive, but it was still very expensive to create companies, uh, companies that were an enterprise type companies. You know, today, 50% of the companies backed by VCs are <coughs> consumer companies. And so the ability for the, the average person to understand a Sun Microsoft 20 years ago and what that investment could be versus wearables um, or, or so many other of the types of companies out there. I mean, even Twitter, I think, has a huge number we hear of, of minorities. Um, women are buying 80% of all consumer companies. So as consumer is becoming more and more important, it opens it up as well to, to individual investors. I, I just yes. invested in a, a wearable for dogs. Really? <laughs> a smart collar where it has GPS tracking and a uh, mobile invisible fence, yeah. so you can hike with your dog off leash. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's, so it's a shift First that's happening on both sides. Yeah. I know, love that. I think Shark Tank has helped a lot. You know, yes. when you look at how pop culture defines trends, you know, the person who starts a business looks at, where do they go to look for money? They go to their bank, go to the SBA, or now if you know, that eight million people we look at Shark Tank, which is predominantly Product. So I think that's helping to define it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I want to I hit two areas we haven't touched on yet. Uh, the first one would be, what do we need to happen in public policy to support you know, a more inclusive uh, environment? Uh, and, and then the other one would be, what do we need to do, uh, what do we need in the research space that can undergird this work? Uh, and then we'll open it up to questions. So, uh, so let's look first at, at policy. Um, you know, what, what kind of policy changes? And I mean, we all look at, at Christine at the SBA. Are you? <laughs> well, you know, I, I will say, you know, the office that I work in, we do a lot more research, but we, we really are always with an eye towards policy implications. And I think 
Um, we're really working hard right now to sort of break away from the idea that we are this sort of one step behind brick and mortar and really to address timely topics like crowdfunding, like accelerators. And also to look, you know, we're statutorily mandated to look at issues salient to small businesses. And within that, we look at demographic issues, at minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, and we're looking, you know, specifically at what are the levers for those groups. And I, you know, one thing for me as a researcher and also I think as a woman in a minority is they're often lumped together and there really are many nuances, uh, even for instance in the Asian community within different